Thank you, Ken, for those beautiful pictures, sharing it with us. There's still life in the midst of those ruins. And in a way, we could say perhaps that, uh, you know, that all the, the vegetation, the life that still exists, that reminds us that even if the, all those seven churches, and we are going to be visiting today with Jesus, the, the fourth of the seven churches in Revelation, we know that they still speak. And in a sense, those, you know, all, all the life that we see surrounding the um, uh, the uh, the ruins remind us that the messages of Jesus Christ to the seven churches still speak to us today. And in a sense, those churches are still alive. And, and, and in a way, really, those churches are us. We could just as well change the names to Auburn and to Colfax and to the many different churches out there across the even the, uh, you know, the, across the world and even across the denominational divides. Today, we are going to be looking into Thyatira, which is a city today that, that is still alive. As a matter of fact, I haven't been to any of these cities, and, and Ken was very good to remind me that uh, last week that uh, this city, actually the ruins of, this, of, of, the, of the ancient city, is, is found in the middle of the, the modern city. Thyatira is about 45 miles southeast of the city of Pergamum, the, the, the church that we visited last week. And um, about the same distance, I found out, and I Googled it and made sure that it's about, you know, the same. It's about the distance, same distance from my house to the, to the state capital. It's off by three miles. Um, and um, if you were to travel from Pergamum to uh, Thyatira, then you would, it, w- it would take you roughly about an hour, depending on traffic. Or maybe if you decided to uh, uh, ride on a horseback, it would take you about a day. Uh, to get there, that is, you know, if you don't press your horse too hard and you, you kill your horse, your horse will not be able to go more than 40 miles a day. Um, and then, uh, or if you want to walk, then it will take you about two days. Two days. Why am I emphasizing that? Because Smyrna, uh, sorry, uh, Pergamum and Thyatira have similar problems. It's just, that, you know, the problem of, of Thyatira has gotten a little bit worse, much worse, as a matter of fact, than that of of Pergamum. We will we'll find out why. But before we, we continue, would you please bow your heads with me as we seek the Lord in prayer. Lord, may the, the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our God and our Redeemer. Open to us, Lord. Open our eyes that we may see lessons vital for us today from this ancient church that no longer, no longer exists today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we get to see this church, and we get to see this church as all the other churches that we've seen, and three others that we will see after this. Uh, through the eyes of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we want to walk up and down its corridors with Jesus, up and down its hallways, so to speak, and, and, and find out what is, uh, what, is, what is up with this church. Now, I want to call your attention, open your Bibles with me then. We're going to read um, from, uh, uh, I don't have a clicker. Let me see, my clicker is not working. Sorry? It would help if I turned it on, yes. (laughs) All right, let's read together. Open your Bibles or just follow along with me. It's going to be projected on the screen. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write... These are the words of the Son of God. That would be the first one I'm saying that, all right? Not before the sermon, it's during the sermon. So start counting the first one. Here's the second time. Son of God. There you go. Uh, Let me repeat. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love, faith, service, and patient endurance. I know that your last works are greater than the first. But I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet and is teaching and beguiling my servants to practice fornication and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her fornication. Beware. I am throwing her on a bed. 
and those who commit adultery, adultery with her, I am throwing into great distress unless they repent of her doings. And I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am the one who searches minds and hearts. And I will give to each of you as your works deserve. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold his te- this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast to what you have until I come. To everyone who conquers and continues to do my works to the end, I will give the authority over the nations to rule them with an iron rod as when clay pots are shattered. And I don't know why I did that, but I did not finish it. So it should go all the way to verse 29. So let me pick it up. Verse 28. Even so, I also... uh, let me pick it up at, let me see, from verse 27. Oh, it's, okay, where am I? I'm getting a little bit, okay. To rule them with an iron rod as when clay pots are shattered, even as I also received authority from my Father, to the one who conquers I will also give the morning star. Oh, I should have included that. Let anyone who has ear, has an ear to listen to what the Spirit says, is saying to the churches. So there you have it. The message to the um, Thyatira happens to be the longest one of all the seven messages of Jesus Christ. I don't know why that is. Um, but he takes time to really, to really go deeply into what's happening in that, in that church. Do you hear the rain? Oh, it's so soothing. I just want to go home and listen to the rain. But we'll have to wait a little bit. <laughs> So we're here and we want to see how Jesus helped this church win in their day. We want to know how Jesus also helps us win today by learning from their own lessons, lessons, hard lessons learned from the feet of Jesus Christ. And so now we see from the reading of this text, first of all, That Jesus Christ, have you noticed that every single time Jesus Christ introduces himself to the first three churches and now to this fourth church, that he introduces himself a little bit differently? As if Jesus Christ is tailor-making how he reveals himself to suit their needs, to suit our needs. Uh, We notice uh, this in the churches, and as we go through, you will see that Jesus Christ will reveal himself differently to the next church, and to the next church. And sometimes I wonder if Jesus Christ were to write us a letter, how would he reveal himself to the church in Auburn? What would, we, what would he say? Because you see, the way he reveals himself has more to do with our needs. He wants to present himself as someone who can meet our needs. And we notice this, this is consistent with Jesus Christ and In the Gospels, for example, we do not have a single Gospel. We have, well, we have one Gospel, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, but we have Gospel books. And how many do we have? We have four of them. And if you read, as you have already, I'm sure, read them over and over again, you will find out that Matthew's presentation of Jesus Christ differs from Mark's, and Mark's presentation of Jesus Christ differs from Luke's, and Luke's presentation of Jesus Christ differs from John's. It is not as if... They are presenting four different persons. No, they're presenting a different side of Jesus Christ to meet the needs of those to whom they're writing their, or for whom they're writing their gospel, their gospel books. It is consistent with what we see with Jesus Christ, presenting himself with his different titles, Son of Man, Son of God, Rose of Sharon, And pick your favorite titles and names of Jesus Christ from across scriptures, from Old Testament to the New Testament. And you will see that there's a little bit of Jesus Christ for everyone to suit our needs. And that is perfectly biblical now for Jesus Christ to present himself in this way. And you will find that in the book of Revelation, you will uh, find that Jesus Christ presents himself only to this church as the Son of God. 
He reveals himself to Thyatira as the son of God, not after the pattern of Mark, mind you, who actually, you know, who, he was, Mark was fond, fond, fond of, uh, of, of, of talking about Jesus Christ as the son of God who, who does all of these miraculous deeds. Uh, no, uh, Jesus Christ presents himself to this church as the son of God in the pattern of Daniel chapter 7. Going back in our minds to that chapter, we, 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 we remember that scene presented to, to the prophet Daniel. When Daniel sees the Ancient of Days with, you know, with, with uh, uh, gl glowing in all his splendor, eyes, uh, you know, all of those, all those glorious things. And his, 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 uh, his appearance is so glorious and so majestic. And then comes one like a human being, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And the description fits what we see here in how Jesus Christ presents himself in Thyatira. And so, we find that as Jesus Christ reveals himself, there is a problem and, you know, when we start looking at those two descriptions of him as having searing eyes, have you ever have you ever um, have you ever met somebody who's got searing eyes? You, 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 it seems like they're looking right into your soul. You know, I've said that of one person in this church and one person only, only because she's got such beautiful eyes, those pale blue eyes with rings, an outer ring and an inner ring in the cornea. You know, and uh, you, you know who it was, who it is. Nobody knows. Who is it? Nan Fowler and her granddaughter. Actually, no, it's not, non, nan, not just Nan Fowler, but also a Campbell. Little Campbell. That's right, Nan Fowler. Are you here, Nan? All right. Yes, that's right, her granddaughter. She's got such beautiful eyes, and when I peer through, uh, into those eyes, uh, I, I, it seems like, you know, and, she, and when she looks at me, it seems like, is she reading my thoughts? Such beautiful, beautiful eyes. Searing eyes and glowing feet. Why? Why is that? It is because of what Jesus Christ sees in this church as the problem in this church. You see, this church is a church on the mend. Jesus says, that he knows their works. He says that their works are better of late than it had ever been. I'm getting confused here now with two clickers in my hand. I know that your last works, he says, are greater than the first. It is a church on the mend. It is growing in love. It is learning how to love people. It is learning how to exercise its own faith, to serve and to endure amidst the difficulties of the society they lived in, and every church has to endure. It is a church on the mend, but it has one big problem. And its problem is that its members lack both the insight and the courage to identify and to address its spiritual issues with love in order to protect the family it loves. That is the problem in this church. So Jesus Christ comes to them, and he comes to them as this exalted king who is a righteous ruler in the, in, in the mold of the, of the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah with searing eyes so to pinpoint the problem and with glowing feet to demonstrate how he's able to, to address those problems, glide across, you know, the, uh, the, the hallways of the church and, and take, takes care of the problems of this church. And with searing eyes, Jesus Christ then begins to pinpoint the problem before, before him. And the problem is twofold. The problem that we find is that, you know, it's, it's, it's there in the text, it says, that you, that is the church, 
one and all, and he addresses it in the singular. He says, you tolerate that woman, Jezebel. And the problem is twofold. It starts with the church family. You tolerate, it says, he points a finger at every single one of the people in that church. And then the, the other problem is that woman, Jezebel. Let's take a look at that word tolerate, because that word tolerate, we've found, we, we've seen that, that word tolerate before. I keep clicking. That word tolerate is the word that we first find in Jesus Christ's message to Ephesus, and that word is the word aphiemi, to let go, to release, and by extended meaning, to tolerate, to allow, to permit. In Ephesus, this word is used in this way. Let's, let's, take, a, let, let's take a look at this. Uh, in, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, this is Jesus Christ's message to Ephesus, and he says, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned, that's the same word, it's just translated uh, differently, abandoned, that is, you have let go, you have allowed love to vanish from your lives. I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. And now comparing this to what Jesus Christ sees in this church in Thyatira, he says in verse 20, but I have this against you, you, ha you tolerate, it's the same word, you tolerate, that is, you, what? You allow, you have permitted that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet and is teaching and beguiling my servants to practice fornication and to eat food sacrificed to idols. If Ephesus is becoming, if the problem of Ephesus is that its members are becoming hard-hearted, intolerant, and rigid fundamentalists, then the problem in Thyatira is the polar opposite of that. Its members are becoming soft-minded, indulgent, indiscriminate progressivists. It is very sobering to see how Jesus Christ looks with his eyes, his searing eyes, and cuts through the very core of the problem, minces no words, and tells it like it is. I have learned in my experience, as a, uh, in my experience that you are only able to say that to the people that you know best and that trust you and that know that you have their best interest in mind. And that is what's happening here. Jezebel isn't the name of the person, I'm sure. It's a woman. It's a woman prophet, prophetess. It's a prophetess that's, that's, you know, that's, that's been allowed to, to you know, steal the heart. This, you know, I could just imagine how... Um, how charismatic and probably even lovely this woman was. It is not uncommon in those days that women should lead in these house churches. And so was the case here. We can imagine this woman to be a lovely woman and a very charismatic one and knew how to teach and and she was beguiling, and she was, you know, the church was going, uh, was going gaga over this, over this lady. And the problem in Thyatira, the problem in Thyatira is that they have allowed this lady to sow, to sow poison inside the church, unimpeded, and so that if we interpret the word, you know, the rest in terms of, in terms of those that still remain faithful to God, we, if we interpret it to mean the remnant, and that is exactly lipos, that is the, the, the exact word, remnant, then it would lead us to believe that while in Pergamum the problem was still in its inception, and Jesus Christ was telling them, you need to address it now before it gets out of hand, in Thyatira it was far advanced. And that the majority of the people there had already 
been won over by this false teacher. More and more Christians in Thyatira are going gaga over this lady. <laughs> no pun intended. Lady Gaga. And so we find Jesus Christ. Now we can see, we can begin to see why he presents himself like nowhere else in the book of Revelation to this church. This church that does not like to confront the issues in front of it and would much rather sweep it under the rug. And so with, with searing eyes, he pinpoints the problem, two-part problem you tolerate. Second part of the problem, that woman. And with glowing feet, Jesus Christ glides across the, you know, the, across that, that church. And he goes to work. And, and, and here's what he does. And I'm glad that this is always how Jesus does things. What does he do first? He calls the false teacher to repent. God never does anything before he has given anybody and everybody ample opportunity to turn around. He says, he calls the false teacher to repent, and then he gives her time to repent. But what happens when his offers of grace and mercy were ignored? Jesus threatens punishment. And the punishment the language that in which we find these uh, you know, that Jesus says, Jesus couches these punishment, it, it's, it's too much for the modern ear to handle. It's too much. I mean, you know, one could make a case, and it's a bad case at that. But one could make a case that Jesus Christ is just kind of you know Jesus Christ just cannot handle people having differing opinions inside the, his church. He is very intolerant. Someone asks. Why does Jesus overreact? What is the harm? Why are his punishments so severe? But let me ask you a question back. And that would be, my, my question to you would be, is he really overreacting? And your answer would depend, our answer would depend on whose assessment we accept as the most true. By whose standards are we to judge Jesus' response as overreacting? What if the problem is truly far more deadly than meets the eye? If somebody is drowning, are you going to watch to see if that child is just faking it? And watch the child go underwater? Or are you going to call 911 right away? What if the problem is far more deadly than meets the eye? And someone who's got a better view, better eyes to see, sees it like it is. And we don't. And that's the problem that we have as human beings. We do not see as we should see. Therefore, we do not do as we should do. Peter Marshall, a great preacher of another age from Scotland, he's walking home one, one night and he tells this in his book, in one of his books. He was walking one night as a young man in, somewhere in Scotland in the thick of, of fog and um, he can barely see in front of him and he's just walking there, and there's nobody around. And, uh, and suddenly, he hears a scream. And it's not a scream out there. It's a scream in his ear. And the words say, said, turn right. And he was so startled, he turned right. He didn't exactly know where the voice came from. And as he walks in that new direction, he was, he's headed in a, new, in a new direction, he looks over on his left-hand side and he notices that there is a cliff on barely a couple of feet, perhaps, no more than a couple of feet from where he was walking. And he realized that had he 
thought, perhaps, that that voice was overreacting and, kept, and, and, and had he kept going, he would have plummeted to his death. Whoever screamed in his ear that night saw the danger he couldn't see and saved him from certain death. And you say, what about the punishments? They're too rough. They're too hard. Jesus Christ, I mean, it would make bad parents look good. What about these punishments? What about these jar this jarring language? Why is the language so jarring? It's so, it's so intense. But we will see. But once, we, I should say, once we are able to see that th this language is metaphorical, it's, but remember what I told you from the beginning, that the language of the apocalypse, of apocalyptic, is very visual. And, it, and, and it's very jarring for a reason, because, you know, uh, God wants to, wants to shake us off of our complacency, perhaps. But once we find that these are visual representations, these punishments are nothing like nothing but visual representation of the withdrawal of God's presence from people that ignore His God's grace and mercy. Once you see that, then you get to see that what Jesus Christ is essentially doing is that He's stepping back, and once, once He steps back from your life, what it really means is that you are left to the elements. You're left to fend for yourself in this brave new world, as Huxley would put it. And this is what punishment means, essentially. We look back at the, the punishment that, he, that he, he threatens to inflict on Jezebel and Jezebel's followers and those that he's beguiled, she's beguiled. And we notice that he says, Jesus says to, uh, about Jezebel, that he will throw her into a bed or a sick bed. In other words, you know, a bed that's, you know, a bed for the sick people. And we notice that this is a metaphoric language describing Jezebel and her sin of spiritual fornication, consummated, as it were, in her own bed. And when Jesus, after he's pleaded with her time and time again, and she ignores her, uh, his pleas, Jesus withdraws his grace, and Jezebel is left to the poison of her own bed to suffer the results of her own virus. It is a scary thing indeed to find ourselves living in a brave new world alone, with no protection from someone greater than us that love us, someone good, someone eternally good and loving, and would not countenance us living our lives in a way that would destroy us. So we find that, that Jezebel eventually will be left to her own devices and that will be punishment in and of itself. And we find as well that Jesus Christ threatens great tribulation. Did you notice that word, great tribulation? And we found that word before. It is what people outside, it, it is what people, wicked people do to God's people. It's the same word, philipsis, persecution, great tribulation. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that the great or the tribulation inflicted by ungodly people on God's faithful ones will return to them and haunt them as they inflicted on us. It is the, it is the law of cause and effect applied to the spiritual realm. And that last punishment that we find talking about striking her, her followers dead. That is actually, by the way, that is not how you say it in, 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 in the original Greek if you just want to kill somebody. Jesus Christ is not 
threatening to murder people indiscriminately. It is a, it's a very strange way of saying, I will strike you with death. Actually, there should be an, a with before that word death, uh, because that's what it says. There's a, the, the, the a preposition N between, uh, before that word death. And literally, we, uh, you know, we could translate that word and it would, it would say, and I will strike you, not dead, but I will strike you with death. Those who would leave God's people bereft of life and kill them with their poison would themselves be left to a lifeless existence, an existence bereft of the presence of God, of the fruit of the Spirit, an existence with no moral compass, no roots and moorings, a life like chaff as described in Psalm chapter 1. In contradistinction with, the, with the, uh, the life of one that is provided for by the grace of God daily. The righteous person is like a tree planted by streams of water. And its roots never dry. And it's always amply provided by the river of the Lord's grace and the Lord's love. But the person who has withdrawn from the life of God and has been left to the elements becomes like a chaff, according to Psalm chapter 1. Tossed and blown by the merciless wind, unable to stand among the company of the righteous, among the well-watered trees nourished by the grace of God. It is a sobering thought. But we ask, why the, jar the jarring language? Well, simply this. But the jarring language is to unsettle us and to awaken us, awaken our senses to God's point of view. We are, you know, the, uh, we're too reliant on our own senses and not on God's senses. For unless we have eyes that penetrate with searing intensity, and unless we have feet that move with glowing fluidity, I suggest we start listening to Jesus Christ. And the jarring language also serves as deterrence to keep poison from spreading and ruining our lives. Jesus, you see, and this is the main point, I think, of the, his entire message to this church and to our church, to you and me. Jesus, you see, is protecting those he loves. And he wants us, as well, to care for his church as much as he cares for his church. And to never be afraid to face the problems it faces in love in order to protect and to preserve the family of God for whom Jesus Christ died, of which we are a part. Jesus expects no less from you and me. And that is his message to this church that wants to sweep its problems under the rug. And you know, there are many ways in which you, you and I can you know, can phase our, the issues that we find in our church, in our family, in our various relationships. But talking, going back to the church, it may be as simple as this. Uh, I remember years ago, in, before Auburn time, there was a quiet man one day that showed up in my church. And um, one Sabbath, and my head deaconess was the one leading out in the, in the first part of Sabbath school, and and this quiet old man just sat in the class, and he didn't say a word or hardly said any word. Um, and then Julie finds him in, um, in the hallway, and, and he doesn't know who Julie is, that Julie is related to the pastor by marriage. In other words, my wife. And um, he said, 
to Julie that, um, you know, I came to this church because I was sent by the conference. And so Julie's ears perked up. Hmm. Why would the conference send somebody and not tell Mel? And so she asks questions. Is that so? Which conference? And the kindly old man says, Southern California Conference. To which Julie said, that's strange because that's our neighboring conference. We're in Southeastern California Conference. Sir, you're in the wrong church, in the wrong conference. For his issue was that he said that he had been sent by the conference to make sure that women are never ordained and that women do not lead in front of the church. Of course, I would guess that Southern California Conference does not have that policy either. It may be as easy, protecting your church may be as easy as that easy. I mean, just call, call it by, you know, call it. Call it right away. Or it can be much, much harder than that. A family joins their new church in, in a big suburbia. And fine family comes from the Midwest, actually from the South. And as soon as they join this church, they realize that this church is deeply fragmented. I mean, they look at the church and they, they try they analyze and they see that you know the, the church is so fragmented it's like having it's like having um, uh, special interest groups that don't talk to each other and they have each of them they, they each have their own pet issues and projects and what, what have you and that you know and, and, and so they notice that. And as soon as they noticed that, they started noticing as well that their pastor was walking into one issue after another, dealing with these factions inside the church. And they did not know what to do. What, what should we do? And this good family decided, here's what we should do. We need to stand with our pastor. And so they stood with the pastor for as long as they could until they the woman, the lady, the, 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 the wife, accepted the call to the Midwest, and they had to leave. And their pastor became very sad because they, he had lost a good family. As he is buffeted by all of these issues, trying to pull the church together, one day at a time, with... Acidic stomach and migraine is taking a toll trying to keep the church together. Churches need families like this one. And you are that family. What can we do to ensure that we protect the integrity of our church family. Here are some four general basic things that we can do. First, first we, um, oops, I forgot about these. Let me just move forward. Be involved. The good people of the church, when the church is being buffeted, don't run away. They get involved. They dive in, not walk out. Second, be informed. Oh, not just what's being announced in the bulletin. Take it upon yourself to become that discerning person that sees the underlying spirit beneath the news. 
interface with the Spirit and ask the Spirit to reveal to you what is the Spirit behind this? Third, be grounded. In Jesus Christ, in the gospel, in the spirit, in the word. Because you see, you're only as good as your spiritual condition is. Because it is God's church for whom His Son died. And it is your church family, your church family, your forever family. Last, be part of the solution, not the problem. Help out. Help your elders. Help, help those people that are languishing over there. Help your pastor. Yes, me. Me. It's, I find this hard to preach this without sounding like I'm self-serving. But you will notice every single time Jesus Christ talks to the church, He talks to the angel of the church. And while to a large extent I've been telling you that the angel is each, is each one of us, each one of you, but, but it's, in its truest sense that angel is the leader, the flock, the 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 the, um, the shepherd, the under shepherd of the flock in that church. Your pastor. Pray for your pastor, because your pastor is as human as you. And may not even see as Jesus would have him see. As we end, I want to go back. I want to go up, go to the. Uh, to the very last, of Jesus' promises. We end with these beautiful promises from Jesus because, you know, he actually has three promises plus one. The last one, well, the last one is not a promise. It's, a, it's, it's an, an encouragement that he's saying, basically, look, you need to keep interfacing with the Holy Spirit so you understand what I'm saying to you because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Stay in the Spirit. Interface with the Spirit every day. And you will be your church's best friend. Three things he mentions in the promise. He says, for basically, that Jesus Christ promises to give us no extra burdens as we fight for our church. Other than the burden of fighting for the church. That's enough for you, he says. And I will lay on you no other burden than that. And as we love and protect our church family and put our foot down if we must, He promises to share His authority with us. Not just authority to just, you know, to, to, to harm people or anything like that, but it's authority and the wisdom and the courage that comes with that authority. So you can shepherd God's people as his under-shepherd. Protecting the flock as Jesus protects the flock. Last, he says, he promises that if we do this as a church in Thyatira, in Auburn, here, and might we say even at the school, at Pine Hill School, wherever it is, Our principal is here, Joe. We've got your back, Joe. The Lord's got you as well. But I'm sure there are issues over there as there are issues here. Let's be part of that solution, not the problem. And if we do that together, Jesus Christ promises, and here's his last promise. His last promise says, I will send you the morning star. No, he doesn't send you Venus. He sends you himself. In his fullness, life with Jesus Christ, overbounding with joy, with the fruit of the Spirit. Can we imagine a church overbounding with that? Our schools overbounding with that? Yes, we can, because the promise is that there will be the dawning of a better day 
better than what we're seeing today. That, my friend, is Jesus' message to you and me. If we fight, if we fight for the soul of our church every single day, as Jesus does. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your message to Thyatira. Yes, Lord, we, we know that you love your church and you fight every day for your church. And help us to fight for your church as well. Because we know that your church will never be perfect for as long as we are in it. But help us to be the, part of the solution to the problems that you see. And not be part of the problem. And to learn to protect your own, whom you love, whom we all love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.